Hello, and thanks for having me. Um, I guess I should start by saying thanks to my colleague, Tony, uh, Tony George Jansen, for connecting me with you all today. Uh, he works over at Google and is involved with the Google and IKEA partnership, which you may know about, but it involves cl uh, cloud ads and maps and lots of exciting things going on over there. So thank you to him and for everyone over at IKEA for inviting me along today. Um, my name's Nick. I want to talk about a topic that's very close to my heart called Everyday Futures. But um, I try and keep quite a low profile, so you might not know who I am. So a little bit of background is probably uh, a good thing, good place to start. So I am an industrial designer. I began my career with James Dyson, one of the earliest uh, engineers in that team, before spending time uh, working at Sony across the UK and uh, Japan. I then moved into Nokia, the, the once mighty uh, telecoms giant. Uh, working in advanced technology, advanced design there uh, in the UK. And then I moved over to the US with that uh, organization before moving to Google uh, about six years ago. Um, and now I'm head of design at X, which used to be known as Google X. And uh, we affectionately call it the, the Moonshot Factory, which is where we try and tackle some of the world's biggest problems by using orthogonal thinking and applying breakthrough technologies uh, to make the world a radically better place. Um, one of the projects you may be most familiar with is Waymo, which is the self-driving vehicle. Um, but there are other projects we're constantly working on. We have a broad portfolio at any one moment, a couple of which are this, which is mineral, which is uh, our investigation into the future of computation agriculture. You know, how can we feed the people of the future? And also this, which is Tidal. Um, Tidal uses its underwater camera systems and machine perception tools to bring uh, visibility to our ocean ecosystems and to try and understand aquaculture so that we can better understand our underwater ecosystems and hopefully protect them. And another project we're very proud of is the Everyday Robots Project, which is where we're trying to tackle the hardest part of the robots conundrum, which is how they work uh, alongside humans in our messy, unstructured spaces. Um, and we're making really good progress on that. So that's just a bit of background into my, my main job. Uh, I'm also a partner at a group called the Near Future Laboratory. I've been there over a decade now, and uh, we work in the field of design fiction, exploring uh, a great deal of things that we'll talk about some more today. And in parallel, I also founded an organization called uh, 100 Pixel, and we advise the TV and movie industry on creating compelling future narratives. So I hope you've got a bit of a vibe for the kind of person that I am, but if we were to add a Venn diagram, I kind of sit somewhere here in between design and futures. Um, I've done that now for, as I say, well over a couple of decades. And I think when you talk about design and you talk about futures and futuristic design, uh, we kind of, as a cultural community, I think we know or we have a pretty good idea what that looks like. Um, it looks like this, right? Nice renderings of futuristic looking things, um, interaction designs of the future, devices of the future, domestic products of the future, you know, they're presented like this. They're very familiar to us. Architecture of the future, you know, very poddy. Lots of sleek surfaces and hard to make things. You know, this is sort of, it's, it's sucked into our cultural norms. You know, we know what futuristic looks like. If you do a search for futuristic on Google, you get these kind of images. It has a, it has a, a typology. And to be perfectly frank, for the first part of my career and certainly my school, uh, school years, I was very interested in this kind of work and I produced a lot of it. But over the past 15, 20 years, that shine has come off for me a little bit. And I think it still has a function, this kind of futuristic work. But honestly, I think it's mostly escapism. I think it's just an, an expression of, of abstract ambition. And it's rolled out at trade shows. And, and more often than not, it's not funded by the, the technology arm of your organization. It's, it's funded by the branding or the marketing teams. And it's, it's sort of eye candy for shareholders or you know, a quest for eyeballs and clicks. It, it's not really a... a, a a rational conversation about the future of the company or the future of the products that we might make. I also think it's quite repetitive. You know, like I said before, when you click futuristic in Google, you get the same kinds of things over and over again. Uh, the same concepts get rejigged and, and rehashed and then science fiction cinema brings them into its culture and ossifies them and they become this sort of seeming inevitable reality. Um, so yeah, it's quite repetitive and it kind of you know, it echoes <laughs> over the over the years. And still from there, you know, I think it's fantasy. I think it's it's in some ways it's a little pornographic. It's designed to elicit some sort of visceral base uh, esoteric response um, and just sort of drive our emotions as opposed to our brains. And 
It's difficult to act on because it shows no transition state from where we are today. It sort of doesn't even acknowledge the present. It, it, it treats the future as this abstract conceit rather than an evolution from where we are today. It, it takes the gum and it stretches it to the point where it snaps, where you're left with the present here and the future here and, and sort of nothing to join them together. So as I say, I, over, over my career, I've, I've, I've become more interested in this topic and, and the challenge of this topic. And I guess the reason is, you know, this is, this is where I grew up. And the contrast between the previous image and this image is stark. And, you know, it's not that this is a particularly low place to live. You know, I don't live there anymore. Somebody does. Uh, it's a fairly ordinary middle class suburban upbringing, which is probably familiar to a lot of you. Um, but those renderings I just showed you and that kind of futuristic stuff just feels alien to this world, irrelevant even. And I've always wrestled with this, this, this conversation about like, what does the future look like for the people who live there now? And, and for me, I, I'd like to live in a world where we're, we're talking about the future as an evolution of today rather than an abstraction of today. And so I've spent my career asking that question and, and I was really happy when IKEA asked me to come and give this talk today because I don't know a great deal about the organization, but one thing I do know is this quote, which is uh, Ingvar Kamprad's, at IKEA, our vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And I think we have a lot of synergy there, you know? I, I do too. I think my job is to do that. And I'm really interested in doing that. So I'm really interested in talking about the future as an evolution of today. So if you'll permit me, I just wanna throw a few things out in front of you about the world in which we live in today. Few statements, few facts. The first is that the population of Earth is increasing rapidly. 152 people net every minute. So every minute there's 152 new people who need a place to live, who want to have a phone, who want a job, need something to eat. Also people are getting older. So for the first time there are more people over 65 than children younger than five. That seems like a lot. I don't know whether we're prepared for that. It's an interesting place that we're at. Every day about eight million pieces of plastic find their way into our oceans. But then deaths from HIV have halved in a little over a decade. 940 million, almost a billion people don't have access to electricity still. Yet the average internet user spends over two hours a day on social media. US heroin overdoses have quadrupled in the last two decades. Renewable energy now makes up more than a quarter of all generated energy globally. The warmest years, the 20 warmest years, on record have been in the past 22 years. It's definitely getting warmer, folks. Interesting conversation about automation here. Since 1980, the American coal mining workforce has dropped by 59%. But during that same period, coal production has grown by 8%. You know, we're, we're wholesale changing the way we do these kind of manual jobs. Over half, over half, of the internet users in the world live in Asia now. And the number of people sleeping on the streets of Europe has, has doubled in the last 10 years. And finally, in this kind of smattering of, of information about where we are today, a third of all the food in America goes into landfill. That's 38 million tons a year. So those are just a few statistics, facts, truths about the world in which we live. It's really complicated, isn't it? I think. Just let's take a moment to breathe and, you know, the reason why I'm here in my nice studio in Oakland as opposed to with you today or even in my office is because the world is going through dramatic change and, you know, the pandemic is part of that. But we also, we should just acknowledge the fact that the world of stasis, the world of gradual predictable change is, is probably the world of the past. You know, we live in an age of epic change, of these exponential technologies that are changing things at dramatic sort of hair-raising speeds. Everything is hyper-connected and there's all these global challenges that seem kind of intractable. And I think this is why I'm really interested in having this conversation with you all today and, and, and opening up some of the conversation around this is that I think now more than ever, every company needs to be exploring the future. You used to have these companies that just made things and then carried on making things until they didn't anymore and that was fine as a business model. But in this new hyper-dynamic, hyper-changeable world, where everything is linked together and everything is changing at incredible speeds. I think every company needs to be exploring that future and engaging with those grand challenges. So what I'd like to share with you today is, 
is I don't want to talk about what to design in the future. You won't see anything in my slides about you know emerging technologies or opportunities or or any even particular approaches. But I want to give some pointers of, of things that I've tried and things that I've found successful about building the conditions for good design work. You know, work that's relevant, that's insightful, that's you know ultimately actionable, something we can do something with. So I have four pointers um, that I think any team, any organization, any group would do well to sort of uh, incorporate into their approach. So the first one is to build a mindset. You know, everything in an organization comes from mindset. You have to have a, a group of people who are thinking the same sort of ways. And as I said, as my, as my satisfaction with the world of future design began to wane, I, I started to get my thoughts together and, and formed this, this approach, this sort of manifesto called the Future Mundane, which was published in the, the, the journal Core 77. And essentially the future mundane is just a very simple three-step approach to grounding yourself whenever you're starting any futures design project. And uh, I just want to go through those three things very quickly with you. So the first is the future is filled with background talent. And background talent is a term used by Hollywood to describe the people in the background, the, the crowds, the supernumeraries, the extras. And the reason why it's important to pull that out is that's most of us. You know, we, we are background talent, almost all of us. Now, when it comes to telling stories about the future, that we fall upon normal tropes of telling any stories. You know, most stories we tell have a central character, often a hero. And most stories have some sort of arc and a, a level of drama in that arc. You know, heroes act as conduits for these stories. And there's a lot of, a lot of things we should be very careful of when we're using heroes and heroic situations and heroic arcs in our storytelling. I mean, first of all, just look, they're all, they're all men in this example, and we find that a lot. But just more about the, the topic of, of what it means to be a hero and why heroes are not necessarily the right thing to focus on when thinking about designing for the future. So Tom Cruise over there on the right-hand side. It's a little trite, this, but these are the last, I don't know, 10, 12 Tom Cruise films. Those are not uh, everyday activities. Those are not things that happen to you or me or anyone on this call. I, I, I've i seen a lot of Tom Cruise films. I quite like them. But there's no film where Tom Cruise needs to search for a part for a lawnmower or fix his air conditioning. You know, the normal things, the normal things that happen to people every day. Yet when we start to design for the future, we sort of design these apex predator moments, these, these ultimate heroic events, when the truth is, honestly, the this is what most people's lives are like. There's no shame in that. That's what my life's like. It's what your life's like. But there's no fights on the top of trains. There's no explosions. There's no uh, fully immersive three-dimensional worlds with gestural uh, uh, um, swipe, you know, swipe gestures, all these kinds. That's just not the world that we live in, and we probably won't either. So it's very important that we think about the future as being heavily populated by background talent, extras, supernumeraries. So if you do decide to use science fiction, cinema, as a prompt for your, your idea generation. Try not to look at the character in the foreground because they're not going to have a life that's going to mimic anything you experience or more importantly, your customer's experience. Just try and zoom in on a person that's in the background. Think actually, what's their life like? What job do they do? How, where do they buy milk? What's it like to get a taxi for them? Really immerse yourself in the background talent. So the second part of the future mundane is that the future is accretive. That means the future just piles on top of the past. Uh, in the same way that these kind of favelas and slum-like environments develop over time, stuff just piles up on top of each other over the years. Yet when we see futuristic design, it often looks like this. Clean, clinical, modern, of a type, of an epoch. Your main question as a, as a good you know, student of good future design should be, where did all the old stuff go? Who cleared it all away? Who, who, why did we blast everything away? And, and why does it all look like this? Because the present looks like this. A little bit. You know, everyone's room is different, but, you know, my room looks like this. Your rooms at home probably look like this, where you have things that are there from before you were alive to things that you bought yesterday. Modern technologies mixed with heirlooms, keepsakes. You know, we're, we're, we're sentimental beings. We keep hold of things. Technologies build on top of technologies. The world is accretive. And yet, again, when we show futuristic design, more often than not, it looks like this. And again, it just leaves you with very little to really, really question. You know, I, yeah, it looks interesting. 
It's a it's a purely blank Cornell box like environment with a shape in it. There's nothing about the roads or the weather or any tax information or pedestrians or garbage or anything. I don't know how this fits into the world that I know. So all I can do is make some empty aesthetic judgment uh, about it. The third element of the future mundane is that the future is a bit broken and a bit is important there. Now designers, you know, I love being a designer. I love being a problem solving designer. And, you know, we always have this intent to make the world a little bit better. You know, designing is a inherently optimistic endeavor. We want to make the world slightly better. This up and to the right addiction that we have. But I think we take it way too far, particularly with futuristic design. And a lot of the fantasy that comes with futuristic design is quite well summarized in this Morrissey quote, which is every day I play a sad game called in the future when all's well. We have an addiction to utopias. We've been designing utopias for decades, yet just look around you. It doesn't really feel like utopia. So instead of being sad about that, why don't we just embrace the fact that when we introduce new technologies, we introduce new problems. The world has things like this in it. Error messages, you know, if we want to tell more vivid stories about the future, we should include these moments. I have an amazing computer running this presentation right now, but I also have dongles plugged into every port of it to make the other stuff that I have work. My watch does amazing things, but also now my watch requires a password. You know, there's a really good Paul Virilio quote, which is the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. And I don't think we think about that enough when we talk about new technologies and new products and new services and futuristic things. The idea of a connected doorbell is great. It means when I'm out, I can tell when somebody arrives and I can leave a message and all these things. But if another part of the infrastructure breaks, then now I don't have a doorbell. Why don't we think about this stuff some more? Why don't we incorporate it in our futuristic design? So that's the future mundane. The, those are three tenets that I think are really good about setting the, 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 the mindset of your organization to start thinking about the future in a slightly different way. The second thing I want to talk about is about situating yourself in that future, setting the context, like building the set around yourselves so that you can start to think, right, what about this world then? I've got my mindset. What does it feel like to be in that world? And the approach that I like to use and the approach that I've been working on for over a decade now is design fiction. And design fiction um, is the brainchild of, of Julian Bleeker, who's a colleague of mine at the Near Future Laboratory, and Bruce Sterling, the science fiction writer. And essentially, you know, design fiction has a fairly academic definition. This is part of it, which is design fiction helps make futures real through the production of diegetic prototypes. And the important phrase there, obviously, is diegetic prototypes. And they are essentially objects which display narrative attributes of the world they come from. So let's pick you up drop you in the future, grab a few things and then come back. Show me what they are. That's essentially what we're trying to do here. We're not saying we want you to design those things because we think there's, that's the future for our company. I just want you to tell me what it's like. What did you see there? So when we come to talk about the future and designing for the future and trying to understand the shape of the future, we often look for weak signals. We do our reading, you know, we go into the internet or we, we pull out our journals or we talk to our external researchers and you start to slurp it all in. You start to look at things and that's interesting, that's interesting. Oh, there's something about genetically modified foods that could be relevant here. Or actually the growth in biometrics and bespoke uh, foods is interesting too. Or this person over here has just come with this really interesting article about how electronics are going to be so cheap that we'll be able to be disposable in, in everything. And there's a nice bit of writing over here that somebody's brought in, which is about the fact that we're going to struggle to find enough protein for humans in the future. And it all comes at you all the time and it's a lot to take in it's a lot to hold in your head all at once and everything's interconnected and trying to make sense of a world let's say 10 years from now any one of those strands is really important so what we have to do is find a way to make sense of it so what you can do is you can kind of compartmentalize pieces of it and say well this is sort of about food and this is sort of about technology and this is sort of about society and what you can do is then you can build one kind of mega deck or, or a document or a or a thesis around all of that. And, you know, you can even pay a nice big consultancy to, a lot of money to help do that for you. And you get this really lovely weighty document full of analysis and text. And it's sort of better, but it doesn't really, it still doesn't really feel like the future. It's just more analysis. What design fiction does and why I love it so much is it says, let's take all of that analysis and all of that understanding 
and embody it in something I already know. Something really mundane, something everyday, something normal, like a box of cereal. We all know what a box of cereal looks like. We know the tropes and the, the, the characteristics of what a box of cereal is. So what if we were to take all of those weak signals and then embody them in the language of a box of cereal? That might make it easier to sort of absorb that information and feel like, ah, we live in this world now. So when it comes to designing our future hi-fi or our future device, we can imagine a little bit more the world into which it might sit. So we should always make those things. We shouldn't just discuss them, we should make them. And a lovely part of design fiction is it uses the skills of a designer to quickly mock something up. So in this case, you know, all of those things I just mentioned, we render them together into a single piece of design fiction. Cricket Crunch, it's a breakfast cereal from the near future made of cricket flour. There's a biometric scanner on there. There's a hint towards GM foods being the norm. And this, this cereal is brought to you by Monsanto. There's a bunch of little like twists on the normal language of, of breakfast cereal that really help us go, oh, okay, yeah, interesting. It's much more engaging than a pie chart or a graph. There can be any kind of archetype, but if you do want to get into design fiction, I really encourage you to try and pick archetypes that are really grounded and normal and everyday, like a packet of coffee. You know, just a little sticker on a bag of coffee that says, we don't track your data. Hmm, well, why would they track my data? Maybe this is a world where data tracking is now a disposable, cheap thing that can kind of go in everything. And how might certain companies uh, prey on that? And how might some companies use that as a, an opportunity to opt out and be part of their brand? Or what if the governments get involved in trying to solve the food waste problem I, I stated earlier? By making a receipt for a breakfast, you know, you can, or a dinner or something, you can start to see these moments when you're like, oh, okay, maybe I wouldn't order so much if I knew I had to pay $7.45 for whatever I left. And what I really like about design fiction is it can be very simple moments. You can have very complicated conversations about the future of, of on-demand food and bespoke algorithmically generated uh, content, let's say. But if you start to say, well, it could render out as a mistake or an error or an unsatisfactory event, like opening a, opening a, a fortune cookie that's just been made for you and it tells you in a very clunky, awkward, algorithmic way that a date you went on is now pregnant. Like that's an interesting provocation about the world in, in which we might live. And I'm really keen that we start looking at things like trash. Trash in the future is going to be interesting. It's going to be different, but it's going to be pretty much like it is today, but there'll be differences. So in this case, a couple of cans of Nova Foods, Italian style protein with antiviral wheat pasta. Antiviral wheat pasta? When did pasta become antiviral? That's interesting. And I can just see in the blur there, it says like Amazon verified. Amazon are now verifying products as well as services. And I don't understand quite what the world's like, but it's interesting. It starts making me think a bit more about the world in a really grounded way that goes beyond uh, you know, a chart or a piece of data or a piece of writing. I just want to finish this section off about design fiction that um, what, one of the formats that we really like is, is the IKEA catalogue. And, you know, a bit sad to see the going of it, but I understand that. But we produced this IKEA catalogue for an exhibition at the Design Museum in London, where we were starting to talk about how new technologies might find their way into domestic spaces. And again, we're not saying IKEA should make VR goggles, but what happens when they start appearing in daily life what happens to what, what does the home of the future feel like what does it feel like to live in that space so anyway that's design fiction and a small plug we have a, a book coming out later this this year the, the near future laboratory my partners and i uh we're working on the manual of design fiction so stay tuned it should be a, a riveting read uh the third part of what i want to talk to you today about setting the right conditions for good futures work is just add an s futures plural um, make, make a lot, don't just make one. And what I mean by this is it's very tempting to talk about the future. Tell me what the future is going to look like. You know, any graph, any chart, somebody will draw a dotted line and say, this is the prediction. And I think we've become a little addicted to this dotted line. We've fetishized this sort of prediction soothsayer kind of, I understand where the future is, let's go there. And I just don't think it's that helpful. There's a a very famous quote by Wayne Gretzky, the ice hockey player, that's been used by everyone from Steve Jobs to Warren Buffett and you know, it's part and parcel of the NBA course, I guess, which is, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. 
which is essentially saying, I don't look at the world as it is. I figure out where it's going and I go there. And I understand the sentiment of it and it's a metaphor, I get that. But it sort of makes sense for hockey, which is where you have an inert object moving in essentially a straight line over a frictionless surface. But the real world isn't like that. Nothing really moves like that. Everything, anyone who's invested in the stock market will tell you that a dotted line is a dream. Nobody really knows what's going to happen. So I want to encourage everyone who wants to work in the field of futures to think in a plural way, in a way that has diversion from the norm. So we often use a, a tool called the Voros cone after Joseph Voros, which is also sometimes known the, the, the cone of uncertainty. And essentially, you've got this sort of assumed probable path down the center that has a bit of deviation, but you know, it's pretty much what we think might happen. But outside of that, with a bit more uncertainty, you could start to see things that are plausible. And the further out you move from today, that plausibility cone gets wider. And outside of that still is the stuff that's actually possible. You know, there'll be a boundary beyond that, which is impossible, which we can all debate. But I think having that structure in place allows you to have a really good conversation about how far out an idea is and how far off the norm it is. And you can start to plot them. You can start to see where your ideas sit. And what's really good about that is it allows you to place bets on, on certain ideas with a level of certainty or a level of risk, but it also lets you isolate areas where you don't really have an idea. Like what's really far out, but sort of plausible. We don't have anything there. Let's make, let's make a new idea. Let's make a new fiction. So be plural in your work. Make sure you're making a lot of fictions. I think it's really important. I think it really helps. The final part of, of what I want to share with you today is, and this is probably more of a wish, than a reality, I understand it comes with some operational complexity, but I would love for futures to become an integrated practice. I'd like for it to happen always and everywhere across entire companies. All too often we see this kind of work, futures work happening sporadically. Either somebody finds a spare bit of budget or we get to the end of the year and there's some left over and a piece of futures work is commissioned or there's a big trade show coming up or an annual report that needs some padding. There's always a big grand unveiling of this singular completed vision. This is what we think the future is and it's dropped in front of you and it happens once and everyone kind of nods and a bit of applause and then everyone kind of goes back to their day job. I don't understand why that's the case. Why aren't we doing that all the time? Particularly given the volatility of the world in which we exist right now. Futures design is also often seen as a bit of fun, a bit of an escape, something you might do at an offsite event or a a team building exercise. It's sort of even seen as a distraction, like let's get down to real business. You know, let, let, this is fun and all and your future fancies are really exciting, but we, we've got to get this thing out. I understand that pressure, but also understand that the thing you're working on right now will be very irrelevant in a sooner time than you think. And actually investing real time and real money in doing this stuff all the time across everybody is really important. And the final part of this is this work, this kind of futures work, is often cleaved off from the main business and the main people doing the main business. It happens in labs or, or R&D arms of organizations. Uh, worse still, it's, it's done by agencies. You know, huge amounts of money exchange hands every year and agencies who don't really know your business at all. They try to understand it in a rapid kind of onboarding process. But it's all sort of detached from the business at hand and it's seen as fanciful and off in the dark shadows done by shadowy individuals and sort of yielded up to the board as this special thing. I, I don't understand why that's productive. I would love for a, a modern forward facing organization or a team to consider futures as part of what everybody does every day. Even, you know, not 100% of the time, but like as much as we can, because I think showing what you're doing today and then showing where it might go is just a lovely way to present uh, new ideas present um, ideas that have longevity and that are in tune with the kind of volatile interconnected world that we live in. So just to summarize uh, this topic, Everyday Futures is, is something I really believe strongly and I've been doing it for a couple of decades. And I, I think it's really productive. I think it's a really future facing w version of what design can be. So the first thing to do is to build the mindset, make sure that your team understands that the future is filled with background talent and it's filled with ordinary everyday people. The future is also going to be accretive. It's going to build on what we have now. And the future will be a little bit broken. Things won't work all the time. 
The second thing that we find really useful is to really build the set around the future into which you want to design. So we use tools like Design Fiction to really build that out, to make you really feel and experience and live in the world in which you're designing. The third is to be very plural. Make a lot of futures all the time. Do lots of it. You know, utilize the Voros cone if it's useful to you, but, but really think about futures plural. And the fourth is do whatever you can to bring it into normal everyday business. Don't cleave it off to the side and have a separate building where R&D happens. Bring it into the work. Try and get everyone involved and everyone engaged. And I think you'll do a lot better if you do. So that's what I have for you today. I really, uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, the state of the world being the state of the world, these things happen. But I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be asked to talk to you today. I hope, hope you found some of this interesting and some of it useful. And uh, yeah, I hope to meet you all soon. Thanks a lot.